Uh, please welcome to the stage Fope Adelowo, Ken Inyorogi, and Tayo Oviosu, as well as your moderator, Jake Bright. Please welcome them. One. Sorry, I'm just sending them out. No, you do good. How'd you feel? Oh. What? So hello, Disrupt. Woo. Africa has a tech industry. And when I first started covering it, I actually heard that more as a question than a statement because a lot of people didn't believe it. Uh, seven years later, the continent has its first tech unicorn, thousands of startups, all the big global tech names are moving in. Every other day, we see eight-figure VC rounds going to African startups. And today, we have the first Africa panel on a disrupt stage. So there's a lot to talk about. I want to welcome our panelists. And the way I want to get started is by doing some quick Q&A with each of them on who they are and what they're doing in one of the world's fastest growing tech scenes. So let's start with Fope Yalawelo from Helios Investment Partners. Fope, tell us uh, about Helios. Uh, how big are you guys? Uh, so Helios is a private equity fund focused on Africa. Um, we manage about $3 billion of assets under management um, and invest in across asset classes on the continent. I spend my time looking at mostly our tech companies in payment space and retail, um, in healthcare, ed tech as well. And offices in? Uh... So we have offices in London, um, but we also have offices in Nigeria and in Nairobi. And you've also been close to two investments that are, are two of the kind of IPO rumors or possibilities for the continent, right? Can you just name those and say a little bit? I'm uh, thinking of Mall for Africa and of course, InterSwitch. Yeah, so um, the two companies I, I spend quite a lot of time with actually. Um, one is InterSwitch, which is a payments processing company. It's the largest payment processing company in Nigeria um, and also has the largest digital payments platform offering payment solutions for banks, individuals, corporates, and government. Um, quite an exciting company, high growth story. We can talk mo a bit more we'll, about we'll it. We'll come back to that. Yeah, and uh, Morph Africa is an e-commerce platform allowing African consumers to connect to um, international merchants in the US and the UK. Perfect, we'll come back to that. Want to go to Ken Inyarogi, CEO and founder of Cellulant, uh, based in Kenya. And Ken, just in a line or two, could you tell the audience um, what you guys do? Yeah, so Cellulant is a uh, integrated payments platform. Uh, we built a payment platform that allows people with bank accounts and people without bank accounts to make payments. Uh, we've specialized in uh, sort of three verticals, uh, uh, payments in agriculture and uh, uh, payments for uh, local merchants, so basically local utilities, what are utilities that want to take payments from consumers, and then uh, global uh, e-commerce companies that want to take payments uh, from African consumers. Uh, uh, we differentiate ourselves because uh, we've built a footprint across uh, 33 markets in, in Africa and, uh, and we integrate uh, deeply into these uh, three verticals uh, in terms of differentiation. And you guys raised a little bit of money this year, huh? Yes, we did. Uh, we raised uh, our Series C, it was a 47.5 million round, uh, was led uh, by TPG through the RISE Fund. Um, so this brings our total funds uh, raised uh, just about uh, 15 $57 million uh, to date. Um, yeah, and so we're powering uh, to grow over the next couple of years across, uh, across Africa. Yeah, a little, little preview. We're doing a little Crunch Base Africa project, and I think so far your round is the biggest one raised on the continent this year, so good stuff. Um, Want to go to Tayo Ovioso, CEO and founder of Paga Payments, uh, located in Nigeria. Tayo, can you just say quickly a little bit about Paga and what you guys do on your platforms? Yeah, first of all, thank you, thank you very much. And uh, it's really great to be back home. I um, was here for a while before I moved back to Nigeria. Um, Paga is a mobile payment company. Um, and our purpose is to make it simple for 1 billion people to access and use money. So essentially what we're trying to do is to solve the problem that is actually exists across the world in a lot of emerging markets of difficult to transfer money and very difficult to leverage money. Um, and so Nigeria is our first market. Uh, technology is built you know, on the continent. Um, and in Nigeria now, we're the largest mobile payment operator. So very similar to a Venmo in this market, um, where banked users can add their bank accounts, can link their cards, 
um, and then perform transactions, send money, request money from friends. Um, and then also people who are not banked can actually put money into the wallet, leveraging our network of agents uh, to do transactions. So, we, um, so we're very excited about the opportunity and I'm happy to talk more about the opportunity of this across emerging markets. And just quickly, we'll get deeper into this, but we broke a big headline yesterday at TechCrunch. You guys had some news, Raise, and uh, you're going to go a little bit outside Nigeria? Yeah, that's right. We, um, we announced yesterday that uh, we closed the 10 million Series B2 round. Um, which, which brings the total, we've raised about 35 million, and, and we also announced that we're looking to go beyond Nigeria and indeed beyond Africa. So we're looking at large markets where these problems exist. Um, half the people in the world who are not banked live in seven countries, um, and 60% of those people are actually women. So it's very interesting, but there's a lot of opportunity, and we're looking to take the platform we've built um, outside the continent. And I think the big storyline, and we'll come back to that, was in our conversation that you're actually looking to take on PayPal, um, the big global payment players. So Correct. we'll come back to that, but that's definitely something to yeah. note. Uh, so I, def I want to start with money. Um, the money always tells a good story and get into a little bit about the continent's VC investment thesis and who best to start with on that than Fope. So Fope, just um, quickly so we give people some background and how would you characterize the VC market, um, both from your own perspective and continent-wide, what's happened over the last five years in particular, which been the last five to seven years have been pretty big in this market. So how would you characterize uh, some of the changes, the values, the volumes, where things are going, yeah. um, and where, maybe where they might go? Yeah, so I think um, there has been a ton of development in the last five years, and it's super exciting. And I'll say just, if, you're think, if you think about it from sort of where the investment is coming from, but even just the ecosystem of players in the space, right? So I think one is you're seeing actually just more founders um, come out and you know, develop companies that we can invest in. And by we, I mean the investment community. So I think that crop of individuals is growing. Um, then I think you know, when you look at sort of the investment space, what we've seen in the last few years is just the number of accelerators and incubators that have developed over the continent. Um, that number's increased massively. Um, and I think that's creating sort of a platform or a launch platform for more and more entrepreneurs to develop businesses. Um, when I look at, you know, I guess private equity funds like ourselves, um, you know, typically we look at bigger um, check sizes. But I think when you, when you think of where growth is likely to come from on the continent, it forces us to look at even the earlier stage companies. So, you know, where you're finding um, what you'd call maybe non-traditional VC players actually playing in that space as well. Um, there's definitely still a gap um, from sort of the incubation space um, stage, um, you know, straight out to sort of the exit stage. Um, but I think, you know, what you're finding is there, there are increasingly more players across the value chain. Yeah. Um, and, and, yeah, super excited about where that is going to go to in the next few years. So I want to press a little bit. Uh, TechCrunch did a market engagement trip in Ghana and Nigeria for 10 days, and we had some debates, and I want to play a little devil's advocate, because one of the things that we talked about was uh, performance in Africa's tech scene is pretty light so far. And we were talking about how if you're in a geographic agnostic VC who's only looking for returns, you don't have any kind of pre-existing relationship with Africa, um, it's a pretty performance-like market. Uh, you haven't seen a lot of exits. There hasn't been an IPO yet. So to somebody like a hard-nosed VC investor from Silicon Valley, you know, what would be the case to invest in Africa? I think simply growth. Um, if you think about you know, most of the sectors on the continent, um, most of them are still on the very early stage of adoption of technology. And what that does is it presents significant opportunities. So for us, the way we think about investments, um, and you know, this is across tech or other sectors, is there are massive infrastructure challenges that you know, when you think about how those get solved over time, I think technology has a big role to play in Africa. The reality is you know, models of investing sort of large um, capital and long gestation periods for some of these infrastructure problems um, probably you know, will not be as successful in Africa. So where you have technology with you know, these small distributed solutions, mm -hmm. be it in solar or payments, those are where the exciting opportunities are. And I think, look, the amount of growth that you can see is phenomenal. Um, the other day I was looking at how much electronic transfers in Nigeria has grown, and that's grown by over 70% year on year in the last five years. Now that number is 
you know, phenomenal. And I think you can see that happen in lots of different sectors, and that's where the growth is. And I think that's a value proposition, whether you're in Africa, whether you're looking at investments in Asia, you're looking for growth. And because you're at such an early stage in the, in the um, adoption cycle in Africa, it becomes quite interesting from that perspective. So I want to get Tai and Kin on, in on this because you guys have actually had to make these cases uh, to investors. Yeah. And in a nutshell, you know, what has been the way you guys have dealt with uh, maybe some of the skepticism or convinced outside investors that you guys are a good bet um, for performance goals? Yeah. So first of all, I think the the first thing you have to distill, I mean, distill for people is that the talent quality and and for I touched on it briefly. Yeah. The talent quality you find on the continent is very similar to what you will find here in terms of the founders and the, and the teams that are setting up um, high quality companies, right? Um, and so if you, if you sort of say, okay, I'm gonna get the same talent um, that, I can, that can run after the idea, and then the question is the markets are so young and ripe mm -hmm. for a long-term play. Yeah. So I think you have to be in a bit longer, right, in our markets. Right, than you would think in, in, in Silicon Valley. But the multiples you can get, I mean, I can't wait to like, give Tim Draper an exit in Paga, right? So Tim Draper right. was one of our first um, angel investors. Um, but I know we've more than 20x his money already, right? So based on our last valuation. So I can't wait till we give him an exit and then we'll tell that story of the kinds of exit. Fortbear wouldn't tell us on InterSwitch, yeah. the, the multiple, but I know it's a very significant multiple of what her company's already earned in terms of the valuation. Well, Ken, does it come down yeah. to that? I mean, you, you guys, I know, and it's, it's not, you're not public yet, but I've tried to dig into as much as I can. You guys have performance, you have results, you have numbers. Does that kind of make the sale um, to investors you know, across any market, across any geography? Yeah, I think <clears throat> if you look at uh, what investors look, look at, which is the size of the market, uh, and the quality of the teams, and, and Tayo makes a good point about the quality of founders. I think I had one investor who says, look, if you look at uh, the nascent ecosystem in Africa, it's incredibly difficult to sort of build out a, a business. So the few businesses that sort of survive um, then have very, very high quality teams um, because it's just that much more difficult an environment. Uh, second thing is just sheer market size. So if you look at uh, payments, which is sort of a hot space in Africa now. And you've processed a lot, like your annual numbers. Can you just share those? Like they're pretty big. Yeah, I think uh, last year we processed uh, about um, $2.5 billion. This year we are right. on track to process about $5 billion of right. uh, uh, payment volume in, in our network. Uh, if you look at um, in the continent, um, in the markets where, uh, you know, even single use cases of sort of peer-to-peer -peer transfers, like in my country, Kenya, uh, the gross volume processed on uh, just one single use case uh, is uh, close to 50% of GDP. Okay. Now, if you extrapolate that across the African continent, uh, which is going to be, uh, let's say, a 1.1, 1.2 trillion dollar GDP in 2020, um, I mean, that's a bloody good business. I mean, um, and, and for a, a payment, and, and the payments models are known. You take 1%, 2%, 3% of gross payment value. It's a huge business. Any investor anywhere in the world is interested in that size of, uh, of opportunity. And just staying on fintech with you, you know, you're in Kenya. You guys have operations in 33 countries. But I wanted to ask how you guys differentiate yourself from Safaricom and Peza. And with Sampeza now, I think you either have that, like half of you or a percentage of you are totally tired about hearing about Mpeza as one of the, the continent's most successful payment platforms, or maybe half of you don't even know <laughs> what they are. But how do you differentiate yourself from them? And, and basically, do you agree that um, the fintech space, which has a lot of opportunity, it's just diversifying across the continent, and, and you guys prove that? Yeah. So m is a huge success. I think it's uh, just about 13 years old. It's a, it's a wallet that's primarily, primarily used uh, for P2P. Yeah. Uh, so it's a combination between a wallet and a cash distribution network. Um, it's $660 million business last financial year, 25 million customers. Um, so it's a huge platform, but it's only in Kenya. Right. Um, and it's primarily a P2P platform. Um, so, in, in a sense, in the sort of stack of uh, payment solutions, it's sort of, uh, you could say, the baseline uh, platform and that's essentially going to form uh, the foundation for Africa. 
uh, what people like us are doing is on, on, the, on the back of those baseline uh, platforms, sort of building these highly specialized uh, multi-country, multi-currency, uh, multi-use case platforms, um, and then giving customers a single pipe, single connection, single contract uh, into payments on the continent. So, uh, so for instance, uh, an, an internet merchant who wants to uh, charge $5 subscriptions from African consumers, right. uh, instead of coming into the continent and finding a license in Kenya, doing a couple of integrations, going to Nigeria, doing another handful of integrations, that sort of thing, that you have a single pipe, single uh, API uh, into taking payments from uh, 33 countries. So uh, that, that's a big differentiator. And, and indeed, we see a lot of customers because the mobile platform, uh, I think now the continent is uh, uh, somewhere in the region of 250 million smartphones. Right, so right. Uh, you can imagine everything that you see on the internet uh, will make its way uh, to an African consumer in one form or another. Yeah. Um, very soon. So. Well, that, that's a good segue. I, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, macro environment mm. for startups. And I think I, I wrote one time that uh, the environment that a lot of African startups, and, I, and I'm generalizing a little bit, the continent's big, there's 54 countries, 48 in sub-Saharan Africa, but there are some cross-cutting trends. But that the, the macro environment that African startup founders face would make the toughest Silicon Valley founder just cry and like give up immediately. And I'm thinking of one time when I first met Tayo in his offices in Lagos and he was telling me about all these plans that he's now made good on and the electricity just went out <laughs> as he was <laughs> telling me. And I flinched, like what's going on? And Tayo just continued to talk as if nothing happened at all. But yeah. Tayo, on yeah. macro environment, like what are some of the challenges that you yeah. faced? How have they gotten better? Yeah. And how do you improve those things to kind of take away some of the skepticism people have about investing and doing business on the continent? That's a big question, I know. Yeah, no, but I think the, the, the main challenge across most countries on the continent is one of infrastructure um, and the lack thereof. Um, so, but even with that, so for example, talking about electricity, we now have 24 by seven call center. That means we're running a generator all night, right. every day. So we're running a generator just to get air conditioning to our staff so it can run our call center. But what I say to people is, if you look at MTN, which is the largest mobile tel uh, telephone company on the continent, in Nigeria, they make, they have, you know, the base stations, every base station has two generators, right? So if you just think about your mobile signal as you're going around here, AT&T, everyone having generators on every single base station, and yet they make over $2 billion in profits, <laughs> right? Just from Nigeria, that's profits. So there's a huge infrastructure problem, um, but if you can figure out how to tackle that, and it makes it more expensive to do business, there is the opportunity to make good returns from, from tackling that. Now, aside from infrastructure, then there are other things that just you know, exist in this, in this market for startup founders that we don't really have yet, or are still early stage. So the ecosystem, the mentoring that occurs, right? Those, the informal mentoring, those are things that we are still building. Um, and so those of us that actually, you know, it's better now because those of us that started 10 plus years ago are now giving back, right? And, and other people are creating community as well. Um, but yeah, but a lot of those things make it very challenging to, to really run your business. And Tayo, I, I want to do a kind of a yes, no thing here because sure. I saw that there were African startups in Battlefield yesterday and I saw them get grilled on corruption, yeah. um, about corruption and is it the only game in town. Just kind of a yes, no um, across each, each panelist and also mm -hmm. to, to Fope, to your investments. Has corruption in Africa, your country, seriously impeded? your ability to succeed? No, it hasn't okay. at all. Um, and well, it's not the only game in town. No, no, no. All right. it's not even. Ken? No, not at all. We, we, we've done business. We, we have never paid a single bribe. Yeah. It's, okay. Yeah. And yeah. Pope? No, um, I agree with the, with the other panelists. Um, if you take, you know, there are companies that are operating and, you know, people still need to pay for goods. People still need to buy things. People still need to consume food. Um, and there are business opportunities there. So, you know, you can do those businesses, you can invest in those businesses without having to, to face corruption. And I think you have businesses um, that are actually trying to tackle it. So for example, um, one of the things InterSwitch does, it's allow go it allows governments to collect their taxes in an electronic manner. 
And you know, some of the stats that have come out of that is some governments have saved up to $100 million just by having a way of collecting their taxes and doing that electronically. So there are things to help make payments more transparent or help reduce corruption, but there's definitely ways to do business um, without actually coming across. So I want to talk about tech talent. Uh, one thing I think is really interesting about Africa's tech scene coming online is it's changing flows of people across tech, but it's not just changing flows of people across tech, it's just changing flows of people mm -hmm. from Africa to the entire world. Mm -hmm. um, you have people from Africa going to work here, you have people coming home, uh, you have diaspora returning. Mm -hmm. um, so let's start with Tayo. I mean, Tayo, you're a repat entrepreneur. Yeah. Um, what was it that made you, I mean, you, you didn't need to leave the U.S. You, you know, presumably yeah, was, were doing uh, pretty well out here. What made you go home and found a startup in Nigeria? And, and you don't need to do that here, but you must have had some interesting conversations with your family yeah. <laughs> about quitting your Silicon Valley job to go home and For found sure. a payments company. Yeah, no, I mean, I was an engineer here in the Valley, um, and then I was working with Cisco Systems in the acquisitions and venture team, so doing venture capital. Um, and, I mean, look, I, I'm, I like to say that I'm a very adventurous person, and if I was not Nigerian, I would have moved back to Nigeria, um, or I'd have moved to Nigeria because of the opportunity um, of that country. So, and, and I really think specifically about Nigeria, no disrespect to any other <laughs> African country, but Nigeria is 180 million people in 50, by 2050, it's gonna be the third largest country in the world, larger than the US. And by 2100, it's gonna be the second largest country in the world, only second to India. So the opportunity to go to a country such as that, that doesn't have a lot of the basic things that, you, that we all enjoy here, um, and to launch in any sector, FMCG, whatever it may be, right? So many different opportunities, right? That's what drove me, to, that's what led me to go back. And you're, you're tapping global talent. You and we, all over. And, and in Nigeria, we're tapping not just Nigerian talent, but also global talent. And I think, um, you know, if I take our CTO as an example, he's a Brown graduate, you know, developed systems here before he moved, moved to Addis Ababa. So what's really exciting me now, actually, is that we now want to take the technology we've built on the continent and go the other way, yeah. right? So, and, and for me, it's very simple. If I'm sitting here in Silicon Valley using Spotify, and I'm sitting in Lagos using Spotify, why, cannot, why can't somebody sitting in Mexico City or Guadalajara be using Paga, right? I mean, we build this platform that is enterprise grade. So I think we're gonna start seeing African technology platforms also go to the world. Well, right? I, I wanna come so, back to that, yeah. um, just quickly. Can you, you hire people from all over, right? I mean, your talent pool is Pan-African, is it global? It's, <clears throat> yeah, so we, we've got a different situation from um, Tayo. So me and my co-founder fully uh, born and bred in, Af in Africa. So we did all our schooling in Africa. Yeah. Uh, interestingly, so we, we refused to go out of the continent because of just <coughs> sheer opportunity. I mean, close to a billion people, basket full, full of problems to solve and so on. And we stuck there. Our team is sort of fully uh, uh, African born and bred as well. Um, our engineering is sort of uh, built out of Nairobi and Lagos. Um, and, and, and um, you know, and, and it's great experience. I mean, we have got uh, good graduates coming out of in engineering school. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, I, of course, we basically exert a lot of effort to uh, uh, expose them to different environments uh, uh, where certain things have been done before um, in the US and Asia and so on. Um, and yeah, and, and it's a blend that works. So I think it's a fantastic area. There's lots of good home, homegrown talent there's lots of uh, good uh, talent that's coming back uh, into, into the country. There's a lot of expert talents that basically wants to sort of um, uh, work in a sort of con a problem context space in the emerging market. So I, I think, um, yeah, I mean, it's a fantastic jo uh, job hunting, fun finding talent. It's and on, on the topic, I mean, on this actual panel topic, mm. you both are doing stuff to mentor. And Tayo, you've actually become an angel Mm -hmm. to some of the young startups on the continent. Just, we have a little bit of time left. Yeah. Um, I guess th the question is why, and, and you know, I, that shouldn't be a tough question, but you guys are still in the throes of launching your own startups, and yeah. you know, why have you decided to already start supporting some of these younger entrepreneurs? Yeah, I mean, the, the one thing that doesn't exist in Nigeria is a lot of high net worth individuals are investing in other, in startups, right? Um, and so, you know, there's a big gap, especially at that beginning stage. And, and so for me and my friends who are, who are formed an angel club, um, it's about how do we help find 
entrepreneurs who have great ideas, solving problems. And actually, we're looking at the whole gamut. They're not just tech entrepreneurs. We invested in a pharmacy retail chain. So just to help and, and, and drive um, what people are, you know, give people the opportunity to get their businesses going. Ken, you're, you mentor uh, young startups. And, and yeah. there's a lot of energy in the younger startup scene, right? I, I, I hope absolutely. you've seen this too, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and it's for the same reasons that people invest in us. I think it's a fantastic opportunity. I mean, the ecosystems are nascent. Mm. Um, um, there's absence of capital, so basically, it's a good time to invest. You can get fair pricing. Uh, you can add a lot of value by mentoring and therefore create much va a lot of value. So it's just a very good angel investment proposition uh, in addition to, to obviously nurturing the ecosystem, which is good for everybody, including ourselves. So I get one question, and it's going to be one, one or two words. So I want each of you guys to name hot tech sectors or countries in Africa one, one or two countries that aren't Nigeria, <laughs> Kenya, or South Africa. So, Fope, you're on the spot. Um, I'd say Egypt and Rwanda. Um, okay. Yeah. Ken? Uh, I would say Ghana and uh, Zambia. Okay. Tayo? I'll, I'll have to go to Egypt. Okay. No Ethiopia anywhere? Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll conclude with that. Um, Thanks a lot. I want to thank the panelists. Thank and you, uh, we hope to have more of you and more of Africa here on the Disrupt stage. And just a note, we have uh, Startup Battlefield Lagos coming up in December. So there will definitely be more, a lot more TechCrunch uh, in Africa and Africa with TechCrunch. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.